Will of Elvis Dumbledore should be where we left off, which means we've got to get through a hell of a lot. Uh, being sick just is not good. Uh, and if you come up to ask me any questions or anything afterwards, you might want to stay away because I'm pretty sure the fever I woke up with Monday morning um, is spiking right now. I feel like I'm about 101 or 102. Um, so just, you know, keep your space. Um, okay, so. Here he is at the Weasleys. This is um, The Will of Elvis Dumbledore, Chapter 7. And this is going to be around 113. We hear, or we see, Mrs. Weasley give um, Harry a watch for his 17th birthday. Whose was it? Her brother's. Her brother's name? Last name? It's not Weasley. Pruitt. Remember the picture that Mad Eye showed, Harry? It shows Fabian and Gideon Pruitt blasted to pieces. Her brother. Okay. And she says, you know, he wasn't terribly careful with his possession. It's a bit dented on the back. Well. Maybe because of what Moody says, maybe it's dented for other reasons that he wasn't very careful. Um, I'm just, I'm not saying that that's the case. It's just, you know. So, um, Scrimger shows up, 12021, and reads the will. And we're going to uh, cut through a lot of it. What does Dumbledore give Hermione? Tales of Beetle the Bard. What's he give Ron? The Deluminator. What's it also called? The Put a Router. Okay. We find out later, much, 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 much later, why he gives Ron the Put a Router or the Deluminator. Okay. And we find out not as long later why he gives Hermione the Tales of Beetle the Bard. Yes. Do you think? First part, when he shows up on number four, Privet Drive. Have a name for it, and that's why she called it the Privet Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, and the Deluminator has a much more kind of specific connotation related to what we find out later. Okay, so. What's he give Harry? Snitch. Golden snitch, first one he caught. What else? And sort of got it Griffin. Okay. So why is Scrimger there other than to give them these things? Which notice he doesn't give them all of them. Why? No. They're what? Three punk kids. I mean. In relation to Dumbledore's age, three punks. Why does he give this stuff to you? Do they have any good answers? I mean, good quote unquote adult rational answers. Why would Hermione like the tales of Beetle the Bard? Okay, Ron and Harry both go, oh gee, I don't know. It's you know, like Hermione's always got her head in a bug. Okay. Think about the Tales of Beetle the Bard, though, compared with the other known books we've heard Hermione read. What, for example, what is one of the books Hermione keeps coming back to again and again and again? Hogwarts, Hogwarts of History. What kind of book is that? Factual, textbook, history, knowledge, information. What kind of book is the Tales of Beetle the Bard? Children and... Fairy tales. Have we seen anything in Hermione's character books? One through... Hermione's old enough. No. It tells us she would like fairy tales. Why not? Not real. Louder. Not logical. Okay. Which we're going to get to. That's going to be the exact problem she has. Okay. So. He mentions... 
Scrimger tells him the snitch will open up for the person who first touched it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, you know, Hermione kind of gets on his case about the sword. Well, wh wh where is it? Well, it wasn't Dumbledore's to give. How do you know it wasn't? Okay. Harry says to him around, it's probably going to be around 129. In response to, this is no joke, Potter. Was it because Dumbledore believed that only the sword of Godric Gryffindor could defeat the heir of Slytherin? Did he wish to give you that sword, Potter, because he believed, as do many, that you were the one destined? Harry, you know, I don't know. Has anybody ever stuck a sword in Voldemort to see if he's... What's he implying? Stick a fork in him, see if he's done. Okay. People are dying, Harry says. The end of this paragraph. I was... N Notice, nearly one of them. When was Harry nearly dead? In this book. Did he nearly die? No. Where did he come closest to death? First book. In the Battle of Quirrell. Dumbledore says, I was almost too late. Harry, yeah, if you hadn't gotten here, the stone, no, not the stone boy, you. Okay, that's why he's asleep, dead, whatever you want to call it, for three days in the infirmary. I mean, this was kind of touch and go. I was nearly one of them. Voldemort chased me across three counties. He killed Mad-Eye Moody. Where's that been in the papers? Where's that been on the news, metaphorically? And you expect us to cooperate with you? You go too far. Jumps to his feet, and Harry's like, all right, let's man up, you know, you and me. Wizardo, wizardo, you know. And he jabs Harry in the chest with his wand. It singed a hole in Harry's T-shirt like a lit cigarette. Okay, what's that telling us about Scrimgeour? He's got a temper. He's got a temper. He's not, afraid to act. not afraid to act. What else? Do do are wand tips naturally hot? No. So what's he showing? There is, okay, power, there is some self-control here. Not total self-control because it's a bzz. Okay, if it singes a hole in Harry's t-shirt, what else must it do? Yeah. So there's, you know, just another little scar to add to his list that he's going to talk about later on. Okay. Ron jumps up, oi, raises his own wand. When did Ron get a new wand? So I'm, I'm asking seriously. I don't remember. Did that happen at the end of book two? No, it happened like, like between book three and three that summer. Okay. Were we actually told that he was... Didn't they go to... Didn't yeah, come in the money. His dad got the... That's right. That's right. That's right. I was just brain uh, dead. So, Scrimger says, it's time you learn some respect. Harry, it's time you... Earned it. Earned it. Okay. Why have all the members of the order up until the last fifth of the previous book, roughly the fifth, why have all the previous, all the members of the order up until about the last fifth of the previous book shown respect to Snape? Because he earned it? Because Dumbledore trusted him. Dumbledore showed him respect. In other words, for Arthur, Molly, who are now members of the Order, but more importantly, for Lupin, for McGonagall, for Hagrid, Snape didn't earn their respect. It was kind of respect him. They were told to. So what happens when the respect him sayer They don't respect him anymore. It's time you earned it. Okay. Harry, I don't like your methods, Minister. Is this the first time? No. Okay. And Mr. Weasley's like, well, children, what did the minister? So, 
Harry kisses the thing. I open at the close. What the hell does that mean? Open at the, talk about a paradox. It's like I open when I close. Explain that, please. Uh, and so, you know. And why did he, Ron says, why didn't want Harry to have the sword? Harry, and why couldn't he have just told me? You know, just nice and clear, out in the open, just. Huh. So, we get the wedding. Hold on, i got to make sure I've not skipped. No, I haven't. We get the wedding, and we meet for the first time. Xenophilius loved it. Just curious, what are your perceptions of Xenophilius Lovegood? What do you think of him? Mike? Interesting. Interesting. Interesting is a weak adjective. Give me something stronger. Shady. Shady? Okay. Eccentric. Eccentric? That's good. Fanatic. Louder? Fanatic. Fanatic? Is he a, you know, wizarding fundamentalist? What do you mean by interesting? It's very new age. Like if you were a muggle, like I would assume that you grew up really into like crystals and stuff. Crystals and spiritualism. Yeah, I I know exactly what you mean. I also like the way he thinks. It's 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 out of the box, but like it solves problems. Well, how out of the box is it? I mean, do you like the way he thinks about the Crumplehorn Snorkax or whatever? <laughs> I never remember the names right. That's that's nonsense, right? That's, you know, National Enquirer stuff. Yeah. Okay? But there's some facts. Think of his name. Lover of races. It's not lover of races. Xenophilius. Love good. Xeno. What is xenophobia? Trump is supposed to be this great xenophobic person. Fear. That's the phobia. Of outsiders or others. Another word for Zeno is aliens. Type okay, not, not those kind of aliens, you know, other nation kind of aliens. Okay. Zeno Phileus. Phileus spelled P H I L I U S. There's a difference between the P H spelling and the if it were F I L I U S. If it were F I L I U S, it would come from Latin. But because it's P-H-I, it comes from Greek. Okay. If it were the Latin Phileus, it would be son of others. Okay. But it's not Latin. It's Greek. And philia in Greek means love. It's love of others. And then love good. What do you mean, love good? Love well. Love well? Possible. Does it mean love is good? You know, like, all's good. <laughs> love is beautiful. Life's beautiful. Ooh, you know, let's get some crystals or, you know, hemp and smoke it, you know. No, it doesn't mean that. There's a word that is missing, and it's intentionally missing, because she's making a compound. Louder. Really close. Love the good. Okay? Plato said, all the way back, 5th century B.C., or Socrates. Plato puts it in Socrates' mouth, but most people think Plato actually was the one saying this. That the summum bonum, the highest good, okay, for humanity was to love the good. What did he mean by the good? For Plato and for Socrates, God. God was the highest good. Not God Zeus. Not God Apollo. The reason Socrates was put to death by the Senate was because one of the charges leveled against him was that he was an atheist and that he led the, the youth of Athens astray into atheism. Part of his defense was, I teach them to love the good, the good being God. 
how, how can you explain that as being atheism? Atheism means ah, uh, no, none, not, the, God, no God. There is no God. And yet I'm saying, love the highest good. The highest good is God. It's the, as a, a later philosopher would say, it's the highest thought beyond which human thought is incapable of. It's called, by the way, the ontological proof of God's existence. The very fact that we can think up of a being like God, beyond which you can't go, that's the proof that that thing must exist. Okay? Take that how you will. So Xenophilius love the good. Put the two together. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a go out on a limb here. You don't have to follow me, Mikey. What? Because the Jesus says that those are the greatest two commandments: love God and love others. Bingo. That's it. When does he say that? It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Who is the Samaritan in that parable? Two. The, the three Jews that Jesus describes walking down the road, they see a Samaritan on the side of the road. He's been beaten and robbed, sitting there bleeding out. Okay, A priest walks by and does what? Walks on the other side of the road, doesn't want to have to mess with him. Somebody else walks by, does, and finally, sorry, it's not the Samaritan line on the side of the road, but it's a Jew line on the side of the road. And a Samaritan walks by to the Jew, picks him up, takes him to an inn, pays for his food and lodging and medical care, and then goes on his way. And so Jesus then goes and says, who's your neighbor? Everyone you come into contact with. That's who your neighbor is. Love the other. Period. That's all. Who slash whatever the other is. And then love the good. God. Those are, Christ says, that's the whole law and the prophet summed up, right? Is J.K. Rowling doing that? Because when that hit me about, I don't know, three or four years ago, I was like, nah, she can't be doing that intentionally. But then why would she choose these names? Why choose Xenophilius, love of others? Because what do we see Xenophilius do every time we see him? With the exception of when Luna is captured and he tries to capture Harry, Ron, and Hermione to get Luna free. And can you blame him? Other than that, what do we see him do? How do we see him act or behave? Does he behave like my terminology? Crazy right-wing Christian, you know, fundamentalist who wants to burn people at the stake because they don't believe the same as him? No, he's kind of yeah, live and let live. Well, how else do we see that? Look at Luna. Apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Luna is very what of people? Accepting. She doesn't harangue people for not believing the things she believes. But she also does what? Think of her comments with Harry at the end of book five in talking about her stuff disappearing. It doesn't just disappear, right? People take it. And yet, what does she do? Does she go banging on doors, you know, wand out, give me my stuff? It'll all return. It'll all work out. To kind of follow up Mikey's thing, it's, if you're familiar with the book of Romans, it's kind of Romans 8.28-ish. All things work together for good. For those who love God, etc. Okay? So, they meet Xenophilius. What's he wearing? Yellow. Okay, I mean, first, <laughs> he's weird, man, okay? Bright yellow, saffron yellow. We find out he's wearing the Grindelwald sign. And the The Grindelwald sign, which isn't the Grindelwald sign. <laughs> Okay. Might she, I'll go even farther out on a limb on this one, might she be saying that maybe we attribute too much to quote-unquote 
signs. Like, you know, if I were to put this, you know, if I were to put a sticker on my com the top of my computer rather than Gold's Gym and I brew the beer I drink, this one, I can't do it backwards. <laughs> what would happen? I can tell you, all hell would break loose. There would be probably certain members of the department going, yes, we got them. We can get rid of them now. You know, closet Nazi in them. Okay. And yet, what historically is that? It's like a 6,000 year old sign. Related to the sun. No. It's essentially this. And yet nobody has any problem with that. <laughs> so why have a problem with this, but not with this? So well, because, yeah, there's a little guy, literally a little guy, <laughs> Adolf Hitler. Was. Unless you believe the conspiracies. <laughs> and he's not really he's dead. Dead. Yeah. <laughs> or he lives on the Upper East Side, you know. Might she be saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't get so entirely bent out of shape out of some of these symbols? Doesn't it depend how they're used? Well, yeah. Okay. But interpretation's up to the individual kind of a thing. So, they keep talking, and we meet Auntie Muriel, who we've heard about before, right? Mm -hmm. Jenny slams Ron, you know, the only person you ever kissed was Auntie Muriel. And then there was Lavender and others after that. Um, you. Um, so, Crumb gets upset about Xenophilius, because he's the one who attributes the Deathly Hallows sign with Grindelwald. He calls it Grindelwald's mark. Okay? And it was carved in the walls and stuff at Durmstrang. Durmstrang, excuse me. All right? So, skipping in... Let's see, do I have a page number written in here? The actual wedding ceremony. This is... Around 143, 144. The same little wizardy guy who presided at Dumbledore's funeral is now presiding at the at the wedding ceremony. Okay. I think I've mentioned before here, my dad used to be a minister, and he had his marrying and burying suit. It was a very not well-paid one. One suit for marrying and burying. Who is this guy? Because it seems this is his specific office to marry and to bury. It's it's almost like there is this, yeah, yeah some kind of class. I'm I don't know anything more than that. So he says we're here to, we're gathered here today to celebrate the union of two faithful souls. Souls are going to be joined. Okay, and we get down to the end of it. Then I declare you bonded for life. Almost like, okay, I'm not equating, but almost like what? Unbreakable vow. Unbreakable vow. Like you break this. Well, if you're bonded for, if, think of what bonding means. The mixing together of elements. And their souls. And their souls. Well, what happens when? <laughs> Horcruxing? Bonded one soul. You split, and you're no longer what? What does What's Your Name say to Jerry Maguire towards the end of the film? Oh, you complete me. Like, I'm nothing without you, and now I'm something. You know? Feminists really don't like that, because what does it show? You know? Women are incomplete without a man in their life, etc., etc. So, not to be taken lightly. Now think about this for a minute. I don't remember if I've alluded to this. 
Talk to me about, quote-unquote, divorced couples. Divorced couples. Not couples where one is dead in the wizarding world. There aren't any. Named. Within these books. Maybe there are in Pottermore. I have not gotten on Pottermore in years. I've refused to because, you know, I don't like, you know, this, trying to dabble with in... in Whatever the world. Rewrite, you know, things essentially. Okay? That's not divorced. He just left her. And what happened as a result? Her heart was broken. Which means kind of torn in two. Okay? What about Eileen Prince and Tobias Snape? Divorced? We're not told. Okay? We do see Tobias Snape as a rotten piece of you know what. Okay? And Snape considers himself a half blood prince. But what is Tobias Snape? He's a muggle. It's like doesn't work. I'm wondering if this kind of ceremony only applies. Yeah, wizard to witch. Okay, and if one of them isn't, well, you never know, because what are you doing? You're mixing water and oil. Okay? It's, it's just something, you know, it's, it, since I first kind of came up to that realization, it's not troubled me, but it just makes me wonder if Rowling is saying something there because of her own history. And I don't know. So, they um, later on they go and they, they talk to Crumb. Crumb talks about Grindelwald's mark, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Says that's his symbol. And I want to get to where Harry talks to Elphias Doge. And tells him, you know, I'm not really Barty, I'm or Barry. He says, um, what about that that thing Rita Skeeter wrote? This is towards the end. And it's 157. Uh, around, I don't know, 153 or so? Maybe 154? Doge says, don't believe a word of it. Believe. Not accept. Believe. Not a word, Harry. Let nothing tarnish your memories of Albus Dumbledore. And Harry looked into Doge's earnest, pained face and felt not reassured but frustrated. I think this is the first time this shows up. Did Doge really think it was that easy? That Harry could simply choose not to believe? Okay. No, notice what Harry is telling us. He takes... Doge's words and say and says, it's not that easy, because what is Doge asking him to do? Choose what to believe. In other words, to choose to believe, as opposed to just believing. See the difference? Choosing to believe is what? A, a rational, conscious decision. It's a willful act, and it's a logical act. Merely believing, without choosing to believe first, that's pure faith. Pure, that's Luna. Okay. Didn't Doge understand Harry's need to be sure to, what's the word? No. J.K. Rowling is setting up right there the juxtaposition of belief and knowing. Two different ways of what? Accepting something, two different ways of approaching truth of sorts. Okay, so we're told here Harry has a choice. The choice is to choose to believe or choose not to believe. Auntie Muriel comes over. 
takes another large gulp of champagne. You don't gulp champagne. I mean, and bleh, big belch. And she talks about there are some mighty, mighty funny rumors about Elvis. And she and Doe start going back and forth. And she mentions about his squib sister and how D Dumbledore did away with her. Muriel, Doge says. A chill that had nothing to do with the ice champagne was stealing through Harry's chest. Why? And what is that chill? This idea of Dumbledore and Dumbledore's image being okay. shattered. It's the image being shattered. What's the image? Dumbledore being this nice his idol. Oh, yes. His idol. What is really, okay, in order for something to be chilled, what must be the state of it before the chilling occurs? Warm. warm. Well, why would he have warmth in his chest? Earlier, book five, when Harry first arrives at number 12, Grimmauld Place, he goes up, he sees Ron and Hermione, and we're told he's immediately filled with a feeling of warmth and love. And then they start talking about Dumbledore. And the ardor, we're told, dies. That warmth, it's like a fire extinguisher is taken to it. Okay? He gets the chill because he's been talking with Doge, and what's going on? Doge is doing what? Using a bellows. He's stoking the fire. He's trying to build the idea and the image to some extent of Dumbledore. And what does Auntie Muriel do? She comes in with her nice little glass of ice champagne and just puts it out. Okay, so they talk back and forth. And notice Harry's just sitting there li listening. What's he getting in listening? Believe. Don't believe. Choose to believe. Choose not to believe. Muriel's giving him reasons not to believe, right? Rita Skeeter gave him reasons not to believe. Who's giving him reasons to believe? A fire stoge. Anybody else? Not in this particular context, but Hermione will later. Okay. So, skip over to page 152. After this conversation goes on for a while, and... She mentions, didn't Aberforth break Albus's nose halfway through the service, that is, through the funeral service for his mother? You were at Ariana's funeral, were you not? He says, yes, I was. How? How? How do you what? How do you live with yourself? How do you sleep at night, you know? Well, my mother was friendly with old Matilda Bagshot. Matilda described the whole thing to mother while I was listening at the... There we go again. I mean, roll, you know, I don't know. Maybe she's writing to her daughter at this point. Don't listen at the doors, Jessica. Eavesdropping never, within the course of the novels, does what? Work out. Works out, never leads to anything good. It always leads to misunderstanding, misinterpretation. She swigs yet more champagne. The recitation of these old scandals seemed to elate her... As much as they horrify Doge. Why? Because we're seeing the two sides of the balance here. Doge does what to Dumbledore? <laughs> Worships him. Auntie Muriel? He's like all the rest. A liar and a, you know, charlatan almost. Harry did not know what to think. What to believe. Phrase gets repeated, two different objects. What to think, what to believe. Is thinking the same as believing? Not necessarily. He wants what? The truth. It's kind of like the old um, Hegelian dialectic. You've got Doge, Muriel, 
believe, think, Harry wants what? The truth. It's kind of like this. These two against each other. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Okay? The Hegelian dialectic. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it's like it. Harry could hardly believe that Dumbledore would not have intervened if such cruelty was happening inside his own house. He could hardly believe it. That means it's hard to believe. Doesn't mean that it's impossible. It also means he believes a little bit of it. But he has to work at it. It's again but he almost now realizing that he didn't ever really know him in the first place. Well, yeah, I mean that realization came a little bit earlier, but now he's kind of getting, you know, the shadow of Dumbledore is being what? Built up by Auntie Muriel. Is Doge denying everything she says? No, he's just saying, you know, you don't know all of the story. Well, why not? Because she was eavesdropping for most of this. <laughs> okay. Notice, she says, well, you were at the funeral, weren't you? He says, yes. Was she? No. no. But it's like Doge is just dumbfounded. He, he, he can't even find the words anymore to respond. Could he? Yeah. Give him a little bit of time. Take the, you know, maybe the champagne away. And she goes on and says, and I think Matilda Bagshot spilled the beans to her. And Harry's like, wait, she's still alive? The lady who wrote this book that we've been using, you know. Okay. So they get attacked. We find out Scrimger has died. The ministry has fallen. What kind of death does Scrimger have? Does he die a tool of Voldemort? He still dies on the side of right, essentially. Notice, he has fallen. Doesn't mean he was taken. Doesn't mean he was kept. It means he died fighting. Okay? So, where does Hermione take him? I, you know, when I do my course in London, students love this. You know, Tottenham Court Road. It's one of the busiest intersections in London. And so they all want to go to Tottenham Court Road. It's one of the ugliest intersections of London now because their building, again, this god-awful monstrosity of a building makes it almost impossible to walk around and through. All right? So why does she go there? It's the first thing in her mind. Other than There's no other significance okay, to that. So they go in the diner. Hermione mentions Voldemort's name. They don't know yet about the trace. But Harry sees something with the two workers. Okay. And they leave from there. And let's see here. I'm going to skip a bunch. Go on page 175. They go to Grimmauld Place. And again, Hermione uses Voldemort's name. It's like now, she, now that she's comfortable with it, she just can't stop saying it. It's like Hitler, 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 Hitler. Hitler. <laughs> so page 175. Harry gets into the bathroom just in time to essentially collapse. Why does he need to collapse? Well, it's because, I mean, he's got Voldemort bursting out of his mind. And what does he see? More, Raoul, or shall we give it, shall we end it and feed you to Nagini? Lord Voldemort is not sure that he will forgive this time. Notice he speaks of himself in third person. What an arrogant this would be. <laughs> you called me back for this to tell me that Harry Potter has escaped again? Draco, give Raoul another taste of our displeasure. Do it or feel my wrath yourself. Harry felt sickened by what he had seen, by the use to which Draco was now being put by Voldemort. What does that mean? The use to which Draco is now being put by Voldemort. What is Draco to Voldemort? He's a tool. He's a gun. Gun's just lying there. Don't kill anybody. Somebody's got to pick it up, pull the trigger. 
Draco is the trigger. Notice, do it, what? Four hours per view. Yeah, and you kind of get the impression the pain Draco causes Raoul is probably nothing compared to the pain Voldemort would cause him. I kind of imagine there are varying levels of Crucio, for example. So that when Harry tries it here later on, well, beginning earlier when he did it to Bellatrix, and he didn't feel where he really wanted to cause pain. He had righteous anger. Here, later on, he's going he's gonna to go, oh, that felt good. <laughs> She's right. You do have to really mean it. So even there, it's still kind of a more righteous anger because, I mean, after all, they spat on McGonagall. Imagine now you go from Harry to being almost evil incarnate Voldemort, and you're doing it. I imagine, you know, the amperage gets kicked up quite a bit, okay? So, Creature's Tail. Third paragraph, first page, that chapter. The grief that had possessed him since Dumbledore's death felt different now. Accusations he had heard from Muriel at the wedding seemed to have nested in his brain. I love this language she uses. Like diseased things infecting his memories of the wizard he had, and it's the first time she uses the word, idolized. He had idolized Dumbledore, and Auntie Muriel's words do what to the idol? They start tarnishing it. Or, if the idol is made out of organic matter, they start eating away at it. Her words are like acid. Good or bad thing? Okay. On one level, bad. On a much deeper level, why? Dumbledore, Dumbledore says repeatedly, I make mistakes. Hey, when I make big ones, they're doozies. Okay. He, he kind of tells Harry, don't idolize me, Harry. I'll let you down. Why hadn't Dumbledore told him? Next paragraph, towards the end. Why hadn't he explained? Notice, if you were writing this in a paper, and you said, why hadn't Dumbledore told him? I would put, told him what? Explained what? Had Dumbledore actually cared about Harry at all? That's a non sequitur. That is, it literally means non sequitur. It does not follow. That sentence does not follow from the other two. It has nothing to do, really, with the other two. Or had Harry been nothing more than a tool to be polished and honed, but not trusted, never confided in? Now, at this point in the novel, you think, no, Dumbledore would never do that. And then you get to the very end, you go, yeah. <laughs> or as Snape calls him, a pig to be raised for the slaughter. Ouch. Snape says that, of all people. Okay? So, here he goes into... Sirius's room, he sees paper and stuff on the floor, notices the scantily clad women posters on the wall, and he finds a snippet of a letter written by his mother to Sirius. Dear Padfoot, thank you, thank you for Harry's birthday present. Which birthday? One year old and already zooming along on a toy broomstick. Telling us, talent? Oh my goodness, yes. I mean, he can fly at a year old. A lot of kids can't even walk at a year old. He looks so pleased with himself. I'm enclosing a picture so you can see. You know, it only rises about two feet off the ground, but he nearly killed the cat. Smashed a horrible vase. Petunia sent me for Christmas. Now, imagine just what that line has got to do to Harry's mind. 
everything he thought he knew about his aunt's relationship with his mother. He just Petunia was sending Lily Christmas presents after Harry's first birthday or before Harry's first birthday? Huh. Of course, James thought it was so funny. He says he's going to be a great Quidditch player, blah, blah. We've had to pack away everything. Had a very quiet birthday tea, just us and old Batilda, who's always been sweet to us. And there, there's that name again. So this is the second time, or third time, he's heard Batilda Bagshot mentioned. So what's already Harry pocking away in his mind? What's he already starting to think? i got to go find Batilda Bagshot, which means I've got to go where? Godric's Hollow. James is getting a bit frustrated. Shut up here. He tries not to show up, but I can tell. Sounds like. Rhymes with infurious. Sounds like serious in book five. Notice. She doesn't state that James has been confined to the house, but it's implied. Dumbledore wants us to stay put. Well, what happened last time Dumbledore wanted somebody... Dumbledore still got his invisibility cloak, so no chance of little excursions. If you could visit it, it'd cheer him up. Wormy was here last week. Seemed a little bit down. Probably the news about the McKinnons. Didn't Moody say they never found the McKinnons? They just, they know they were killed? Or was it that only bits of them were found? It was particularly nasty, whichever case it was. Okay. Batilda drops in, tells us Wonderful stories about Dumbledore. Dot, dot, dot. Here's like, what? Where? You know. He reads the letter again. Why? Because seeing his mother's handwriting made him feel like a little, friendly little wave glimpsed from behind a veil. Veil of death. The veil of the piece of paper. Think about what writing really is. Keep going. Why, assuming you've heard this, when you write about literature, do you know what tense you use? You use present tense. Why? Because you're entering into a conversation that is ongoing. Conversation began a hell of a long time. When the first person who ever wrote about a story wrote Epic of Gilgamesh or something like that. That conversation is still going on. The person who wrote Epic of Gilgamesh stepped outside the room. You entered at some point. Okay? What else? What does Arthur Weasley tell Ron? Never trust a magical thing. What? That can think for itself, but you don't know where it keeps its brain. Where's the brain here? Just in this single piece of paper. Is the brain in J.K. Rowling's head? No, it's not. Is the brain in my head? No, it's not. What is it? It's the meaning of the two brains where? In the words. That's why each person in this room, when you first read this novel, I bet every one of you had, at the very least, slightly different interpretations. Why? We all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different upbringings. Some of you might come from a family where you're the only child. Some of you might come from a family where you are one of many children. Well, just that little difference is going to be huge in your reading of these books. Okay? Some of you might come from an extremely wealthy family. Some of you might come from a dirt poor family. Some of you might come from a family where everybody has a college degree. Some of you might come from a family where you're the first one. And if you're the first one, what does that mean? Especially if there are others behind you. How much rides on your successful completion? An awful lot. Okay? It's the interaction with the text. Because John Milton says in a little book he wrote called Areopagitica, which is about... Defense of free speech. 
Okay? Every book is a person speaking. As good killing men as kill a good book. Why? Because you're killing, essentially, the voice behind it. That's why Ray Bradbury wrote the Fahrenheit novel Fahrenheit 451. That's why he's so utterly against censorship. And I'm right with him. Okay? Much rather have everything that's ever written, even the utter filthy, rotten, garbage, trash, pornography, all of that. Have all of that in the library, then have, oh, I don't know, you decide what gets to be in it, what gets not to be in it. Because Cheyenne might have different tastes than I do. Right? Or, if you're talking about children, each parent should decide for his or her own children, not for somebody else's children. So, here he's trying to think. What is this letter useful for? What can I gain from it? The only potentially, next page, the only potentially useful thing he could see was possible information on Dumbledore. Is that the only potentially useful thing? Okay. And... Ron and Hermione come in, and he starts talking to them about Matilda Bagshot. And Auntie Muriel in the conversation with Doge. And Hermione says, well, let me back up a little bit. Hermione says, um, I understand why you'd love to talk to her about your mom and dad. That is why you'd like to talk to Matilda Bagshot. But that wouldn't help us in our search for Horcruxes, Harry. Remember, Horcruxes, Harry. Focus. Horcruxes. Nothing else. I know you want to go to Godric's Hollow, but you know, I'm scared. I'm scared of how easily those Death Eaters found us. And, you know, what are they must be thinking? Well, they're going to be guarding Godric's Hollow. Harry, it's not just that. It's other stuff. I want to know the truth. So he tells her everything. She goes, well, I can see why that upset No, I'm, oh, Harry, you're upset. You know, take an aspirin, take a nap. You'll feel better when you wake up. I'm not upset. He's saying this isn't just emotional. I want to know whether it's true or not. Okay, She's equating his emotions with desire for truth. Do you really think you'll get the truth from a malicious old woman like Muriel or from Rita Skeeter? Ah, now she's applying a little bit of logic. What is she really saying? How can you believe them? You knew Dumbledore. Well, what else could she say there? Does he know really Auntie Muriel? No, he met her for a few minutes and she was drunk. You gotta get you gotta admit she was drunk. But he knows Rita Skeeter. He's had a number of interactions with her, including in the broom closet where he opened his mouth and the quill just started writing before he even uttered a sound. Okay. You knew Dumbledore. Oh, I thought I did. Notice, muttered. Why muttered? Why doesn't he say this clearly, forcefully, strongly? Okay, doesn't have a strong conviction of it. He's also a little upset. Going back to what Hermione said. Okay. But you know, no, not believe, no, how much truth there was in everything Rita wrote about you. Well, including what? He falls down and has spells or has seizures. He sees things. He says things. He goes to bed every night crying over his dead parents. He's in love with me. <laughs> Come on, Harry. What did she ever write that was true? Only what was reported in the Quibbler and only why? Because Hermione had a knife to her throat. <laughs> Doge is right. How can you let these people tarnish your memories of Dumbledore? What gets tarnished? Where do we use that word? What? Silver. Silver and gold. So what happens to it? Silver 
gets a dark kind of a film, and you have to scrub it. You have to really polish it to get it off. She's saying your memory should be what? Like shiny silver, Harry. Remember Dumbledore. It's almost like remember Cedric Diggory. Is he saying remember Cedric Diggory? Spread up? No. Remember how he was before then. What do you mean? There's a saying about something about remember who I am, not what I've done. Or something. The, the... You mean in the books? No, just oh. in general. Uh, that I don't know. I know Brutus, Mark Antony, because we just did this in my Shakespeare class. Mark Antony says about Julius Caesar and his burial. The good men do is often turred with their bones. The evil lives on after. That is, we think of the bad stuff people do. We don't remember the good stuff they did. Because not everybody, not anybody, only does evil or only does bad stuff. Not even, you know, Osama bin Laden didn't, quote unquote, only do evil. He did do some good stuff. Ah, dare I even say it? Mr. Ray of Sunshine himself didn't only do evil. He brought the German nation out of the Depression. Yeah, through some bad means. <laughs> okay. There it was again. Choose what to believe. He wanted the truth. Well, where was the first time we heard this? It wasn't this book. It was in the previous book. When he's talking with Lupin and Arthur Weasley... And he says, yeah, but even Dumbledore admits he can make mistakes. They're talking about Snape and why they should trust Snape. This is before Snape kills Dumbledore. Well, because Dumbledore trusts him, and that's good enough. Harry's like, I, I want to know. I want to know why we should trust Snape. Well, Harry, wait a few hundred pages and you'll find out. Okay. So, they realize... As they're walking through the house, they find another bedroom with a sign on it. Do not enter without... <coughs> I was the same kid. Do not enter without the express permission of Regulus or Tourist Black. Except my brother and I always shared a room. So, you know. What's he saying? My space. Not the pre-Facebook thing. My space. Stay away. R-A-B, I've found him. Why? Because he knows what the locket says. Okay. So, skip a bunch again. What do they do to try to find the locket? Oxia locket. Doesn't work. Why not? It's not there, obvious reason. Does it work on Horcruxes? I don't know. Well, okay. Well, it's, and it goes back to the thing about they can't just open it either. You have to talk to them and talk with them. Okay. Um, Why else? Is it going to be that easy? No. Does magic, meaning the wizard and which kind of magic in the novels, ever solve any basic problems? No, it doesn't. What solves the basic problems? Bingo. Whether it's this kind of work a little bit later on, or this kind of work. Sorry. Or diving into the into the frozen hole. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So they talk to creature, and I'm gonna. Skip a bunch. Okay. What does Creature tell them? Without talking about the specific. What did Creature do for Regulus? Okay. He went off, first of all, with Voldemort. Voldemort. Did what Voldemort told him to do. And then what did Voldemort expect to happen? He would die there. But, they all said different magic. 
Elves have different say. magic, and what did Master Regulus say? Come here. Come back. Come back when you're done. Well, and that come back when you're done isn't just a, you know, when you have time, if you want to. It, it was a command, and so he did. Voldemort had no idea that that could happen. Okay? So, Harry's like, wait, I, 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 I don't get you, creature. This is um, a couple pages before the end of the chapter. Voldemort tried to kill you. Regulus died to bring Voldemort down. But you're still happy to betray Sirius to Voldemort? You were happy to go to Bellatrix and Narcissa? Pass information? Hermione, every creature doesn't think like that. And if I were Harry, I'd go, shut up. How? You're not a house elf. Quit trying to tell me how he thinks. Anyway, she goes on. He's a slave. House elves are used to bad, even brutal treatment. How does Harry know that personally? Well, you must not have met many decent wizards. And now he's, ah, you know, bangs his head against the window. Because Harry asked him to sit on his bed. What Voldemort did to creature wasn't that far out of the common way. What do wizard wars mean to an elf-like creature? And we could expand that. Or to a goblin-like grip hook. Or to a... Uh, okay, centaur. Or to a... Um, what's Buckbeak? Hippogriff. Or to a hippogriff, like Buckbeak, etc. He's loyal to people who are kind to him. Mrs. Black must have been. Regular certainly was. So he served them willing. I know what you're going to say. Don't blame, you know. But he, Regulus, didn't explain everything to Creature. And I think I know why. Creature and Regulus' family were all safer if they were kept to the old, pure bloodline. Regulus was trying to protect them all. In other words, when Regulus died, how did he die? What was he essentially doing? Putting, putting them above them above himself, trying to stop Voldemort, sacrificing himself. And what did Sirius say? My stupid brother went and got himself killed by Voldemort. Sirius implies it was Voldemort personally. Okay, so what does that mean? If Hitler's coming for you personally, if Satan's looking for you personally, what does that mean? Well, you know, I must be something pretty special. Yeah, kind of. Regulus had merited Voldemort's personal attention. After all, why do we see Draco terrorizing Raoul? Did Voldemort show up at Tottenham Court Road? No, he sent his minions. Okay. But he does show up where? Number four, Privet Drive. Okay. She goes on. Sirius was horrible to creature. Yeah, I know you don't want to hear this. It's no good looking like that. I've said it all along. Wizards would pay for how they treat house elves. Well, Voldemort did, and so did Sirius. And he thinks of what Dumbledore said. I don't think Sirius ever saw creature as a being with feelings as acute as a human's. In other words, he saw creature as what? <coughs> Less than human, rather than equal but not human. That is, magical creatures have seemingly equal status. Why do centaurs have such a problem with people like Umbridge? Because she calls them half-breeds. And they're like, we're not half-breeds, we're noble. You know. So... Harry, creature, when you feel up to it, please sit up. When you feel up to it, what's he giving creature? Choice. What kind of choice? Okay, kind of. You can stay down there. Exactly. You can stay down there as long as you want. But when you feel up to it, that is when, when you're calm, Please sit up. He doesn't say, creature, when you feel up to it, get your ass up here. Several minutes, creatures. He says, I'm going to ask you to do, ask. He doesn't say, I'm ordering. I know, it's semantics. Because here he is, his owner. Okay. 
I want you to go find Mundungus Fletcher. I want you to find out where the locket is. Master Regulus is. And then what does he put for the cherry on top? He'll give him. Not he will give him. Here it is. He does give him this locket. Why is why is that important? Because it belonged to Regulus. Keep going. Keep going. He used to own something. Bingo. Okay. He now owns something that belonged to Regulus. This becomes what for Creature? What did he used to have in his little hidey hole den kind of a thing? A shrine. This is a, for lack of a better term, a relic for him. This is something that connects him to Master Regulus. Okay. This is really important that Harry does this. Ron. Overkill, mate. Why? Because Ron's an idiot. Ron doesn't see the power in the import of that gesture to creature. Here he does. Hermione's probably sitting back there going, oh, you go, Harry. You're starting to, you get it now. You understand. Okay? Um, okay, so let's see. Chapter 11... Um, Lupin shows up, page 207, they're reading about Harry's now wanted for questioning for the death of Dumbledore and such, and Lupin says, about page 208 or so, you know, it's a master stroke, one, you know, putting Harry's picture, why? Because it now causes people to think, hmm, maybe he's involved. This is propaganda at its highest level. Now that Dumbledore is dead, you, the boy you live, were sure to be a symbol or rallying point for any resistance, suggesting you had a hand in the old hero's death. They've now set a price on your head and sown doubt about you. Okay. They read on about the Muggle-born Registration Commission. Sound like anything historical? 1930s in Nazi Germany, requiring Jews to register. And one of the reasons was for that was to then require them to require them to live in certain areas. Like, for example, in Poland, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Okay? Ron, people won't let this happen. Lupin, it is happening, Ron. Why is it happening? Remember I put on the board a week or so ago? All that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good men, people to do nothing. Well, why are there so many good witches and wizards doing nothing? They're afraid. Because if you do something, what does that do? Puts a big old bullseye right on you. All right? Ron, well, I would, you know, if they come after Hermione, I'll just tell everybody she's my cousin. Hermione covers Ron's hand with hers and squeezes it. Thank you, Ron, but I couldn't let you. You won't have a choice. <laughs> In other words, shut up. Asserting my male dominance here, you know, I'm going to be patriarchal, you know. <laughs> she laughs. Is, she's probably like, really? <laughs> I can take you so fast, you know. Okay. They have to be able to prove blood status, etc. So, what's the importance of this chapter? Is it learning about the Muggle-born Registration Commission? Uh-oh. What does Lupin offer them? To help. How? Protection. Protection? To go with them. And Harry's like... Think about this for a minute. Um, Hermione's like, um, what about Tonks? Well, what about her? <laughs> Not the right response from a newlywed, relatively newlywed. Well, I mean, you're married. What does she think? Oh, she'll be fine. She'll be safe. Okay, she's pregnant. Oh, I'm gonna, you know, Hermione goes all crazy. Uh, Harry, okay, so wait, wait. 
what's Harry thinking? Keep going. He's thinking of himself. I don't mean thinking of himself right here. He's thinking of himself as a one-year-old boy who lost his parents. Wait, wait. So you want to leave Taunts at her parents' house and come away with us? She'll be safe there. They'll look after her. Yeah, because everything we've seen of Ted Taunt shows us real mighty warrior, right? Um, I'm sure James would have wanted me to stick with you. Notice how he pulls out that ace in the hole, you know. And if James were obviously serious too, would have. I'm not. I'm pretty sure my father would have wanted to know why you aren't sticking with your own kid. Lupin's face drained of color. Why? Because he understands now. He knows exactly where Harry's going, and it's almost like you, let's stop this conversation right now, okay, Harry? Harry, you don't understand. Explain that. Notice what Lupin doesn't add. You don't understand because you're too young. You don't understand because you're not married. You don't understand because you don't have a kid coming. It's, he's saying, he's not using, in other words, identity politics. He's not saying you don't understand because you're not, you know. Harry, shut up. I'm getting tired of Siri. Explain. I made a mistake in marrying Tom's. Sucks to be you. What is the, okay, so he made a mistake. So what's he suggesting then? I made a mistake. Now I don't want to be. Huh. I did it against my better judgment. I've regretted it much ever since. Harry, okay, so you're just going to dump her and the kid and run off with us. Dump her and the kid sounds kind of like whom? Tom Riddle. Wow. So you're going to make your unborn baby into maybe the world's next Voldemort? You know, I'm not suggesting Harry's suggesting that. But that's what happened before. Been reading a bunch of articles about you know school shooters, you know the you know pretty much the one real important link that goes to all of them. It's not that they're all male. I mean that is part of it. They're all almost all males who haven't been raised in a home with a father. And I'm not saying anything about single parent you know woman headed homes. I'm just saying. All of these studies have said, you know, almost to a T, it's like 99, it's like 90% of school sh shooters are boys who have been raised without father figures. There's, there's some correlation there, okay? So Harry says, so you're just going to loop and you know, Zim's fighting words, boy. Don't you understand what I've done to my wife and my unborn child? Notice the tense. What I've done. It's what? It's already done. It's in the past. What can Lupin not do? I mean, you can't undo it. Wow, I take that back. <laughs> Go down to the Ministry of Magic. Get a time turner. <laughs> you can probably take it back. I should never have married her. I've made her an outcast. Notice, I should never have married her. Volition, his part. Oops, big mistake. I made her an outcast. What's he denying Tonks? Louder. Free will, her choice, her agency. Was, was Tonks forced into this marriage? Did they drag her to the ceremony? She knew what she was getting into. Yeah, it was exactly. It was the other way around. It was like, well, and she's like, oh, really, Miss? Yeah, you know, she was the one madly, seemingly head in heels over love with him. You've only ever seen me amongst the order. In other words, where what kind of people are good people, open people, forgiving people, xenophilious kind of people. 
people who love others, like, oh, I don't know, a werewolf, a half-giant, another half-giant. <laughs> My kind don't usually breed. What's he saying about himself? I'm an animal. Animals breed. Humans procreate. <laughs> you don't use breed to talk about people unless you're doing what? Dehumanizing them. It will be, notice, it. Not he, not she. It will be like me. Meaning? Werewolf. How can I forgive myself when I knowingly risk passing on my own condition to an innocent child? Own condition. Take it outside the world of the book for a moment, the world of the novel, and put that in our world. What kind of condition would be equivalent or similar to? AIDS? An AIDS baby? A kid born, born with fetal alcohol syndrome? So what's the option? Notice she never introduces it. She never introduces abortion. Why not? J.K. Rowling is pro-abortion. She fully supports it. Why doesn't she introduce it? I'm just curious why she doesn't. All right? But Lupin never does. Could be. Hermione, Remus, nobody could ever think that about you. Harry, I'd be pretty ashamed of him. If the new regime thinks muggle-borns are bad... What will they do to a half werewolf whose father's in the order? I mean, that's like quarter muggle born, you know. I mean, that's really bad. My father died trying to protect my mother and me. You reckon he'd tell you to abandon your kid to go on an adventure with us? Notice Harry has just done what to the heat in the room? Whoosh, cranked it up, man. He is just why does he do this? To get Lupin to realize? Louder? To make him not want to come. To make Lupin change his mind. Or, to put it another way, see clearly. Well, it could be uh, she never brings up abortion in that, but it could also be that she's showing that Remus never thinks about that. Because he, he wants the kid, he's just ashamed that it's there's a chance that it's going to come out like him. That's what he's afraid of, but I mean, he doesn't ever want to get rid of the kid. And Hermione's like, and your kid would be blessed if he came out like you. I mean, think of all the good qualities Lupin has. Qualities that Sirius didn't have. Qualities that James didn't have. Okay? Lupin, how dare you? This is not about a desire for personal, for danger of personal. How dare you? Oh, I, I don't know. I think you want to fill serious issues. Yeah, he, you know, Hermione, Harry, no. In other words, Harry, too far, too far, Harry. It's like, you know, both barrels are loaded. <laughs> He's going to pull. I never would believe this. The man who taught me to fight Dementors. A coward. That's the final straw. Lupin draws his wand so fast, Harry had barely reached for his own. In other words, you know, if you're familiar with uh, Blazing Saddles, this is Cisco Kid. You know, we Harry, how could you? As Lupin leaves. Harry, it was easy. He stood up. Don't look at me like that, Hermione. Ron, don't you start on her. No, Hermione, no, no. Can't we just all love each other? Can we stop fighting? Ron, you shouldn't have said that stuff. Again, Ron doesn't see. Ron doesn't understand. Harry, he had it coming. And the narrator shows us what Harry is thinking. Broken images racing each other through his mind. Sirius falling through the veil. Dumbledore suspended, broken in midair. A flash of green light. His mother's voice begging for mercy. Dot, dot, dot. 
Why the dot, dot, dot? The images continue, I think. Hedwig. Like Shrek, you know. Shrek, just a few feathers. Oh, sorry. Mad-Eye Moody. Jump forward. Cedric. Parents. And if I were directing this, I would have Harry speak this in a very kind of short, slow, kind of staccato, but not fast, fashion. Parents shouldn't leave their kids unless they've got to. Because he's thinking of his mom. He's thinking of his foster parents, Dumbledore, Sirius, I think Mad Eye. Hermione, Hermione says, Harry. She reaches out, he shrugs off and goes away. He comes back. I know I shouldn't have called him a coward. In other words, he's not a coward. That's what Harry means. And yet, that's what was needed. What did he essentially do? I don't usually go in for this kind of reading criticism. What Dumbledore has been doing the most? Making him learn the things instead of straight out telling him. Okay, that's one thing. What else does he do? It's more basic than that. It applies to all the men in this room. He challenges his manhood. He challenges Lupin's masculinity by calling him a coward. That's his way of saying, you have a wife and child, and it is your duty to protect them. Tox is probably well capable of protecting herself, not, not denying that. Okay? But if it makes him go back to Tox, it'll be worth it. And he does. So, we get the extract from the upcoming biography of Albus Dumbledore by Rita Skeeter. And we're going to skip it. Magic is might. <laughs> Magic is might. We're going to skip. Okay. We've already talked about the throne that they see when they go in the atrium. Um, Muggleborn registration. I, I want to skip all that. Not all that important. I mean, they get the locket. Chapter 14. We've got a couple of minutes. Um, who's the thief that the chapter is titled after? Mikey, who do you think it is? How do you know it's Grindelwald? How do you know it's not Dumbledore? Dumbledore has auburn hair. What color hair does Grindelwald have? Blonde or golden. So, um, Harry wonders why, about four pages before the end, wonders why Dumbledore hadn't explained more. He, Harry, thought there would be plenty of time for Dumbledore to explain. And that's when he sees the corridor. Gorvich burst into the room at the end of a passage, and there on the window edge, ledge, sat perched like a giant bird, a young man with golden hair. Split second, and we hear the voice, where is it? Who is it? You know. And Gorvich gets what? Okay. Um, so when we come back, we'll pick up with chapter 15. And I don't know how we've got it. I might have to finish part of this via video lecture that I've already got done. Because 